I'm just waiting for it to come up on the doodah. There. Got it. Um, screen share. I, I saw a deer last night. Oh, yeah. Wait, walking, what's... In the middle, walking in the middle of the bloody road, right? Uh, it was a stag walking towards the car, right? And I thought, right, if my car's going to get trashed now, I want to be able to film this. I thought, right, if, if, if you know, if it's going to, if it's going to do my car over, I want to be able to film this. And I, and I filmed it. Oh. And unfortunately, it didn't charge up my car or smash my car up, which is a bit of a shame. Um, because I could have claimed on the insurance. Mind you, I don't know if I, could I have claimed on the insurance? I'm sure I could have. Yeah. But it would have made great film footage. It would. It really would have. But so I'm just uh, I've, I've got this uh, I've got this online now. I'm just waiting for the last echelons. So anyway, which type of comedian? Which um, which type of comedians are you into? Well, I, I'm old school, really. Um, I am. Um... I don't think great much of the modern comedians. They're far too foul-mouthed. And they're, what about more, Jasper? Go on. they're more observers of, uh, of society and taking the mickey. But I, I like the old-style um, Bob Monkhouse, uh, Bernard Manning, uh, you know, where they actually... Ken Dodd, where they make uh, tell jokes. Bernard Manning, he, 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 he had no prisoners. No, Roy Chubby Brown, another one. Very you, rude. So you, like, you like Roy Chubby Brown then, yeah? Pardon? You like Chubby Brown? Well, yeah, he makes me laugh. I, I, don't want, I, I think he's not, I don't think he's a particularly nice person, but uh, he makes me laugh, like uh, Jethro, you know, from Cole. He, I don't. Yeah, I don't think Bernard Manning was a nice person either, but he, but he made people laugh. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's it's not him, is it? It's um, it's his humour. It's a, uh, it's the irony. Yeah, the new so ones. Not, I, I chuckle. So you're, you're not a fan of um, Billy Connolly, then? Oh yeah, yeah. All oh, right, all yeah. oh, right, because because you said you didn't like observation comedy, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're right there. Yeah, I sort of shot myself in the foot there. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. I do like Billy Connolly. Well, some of his stuff. It's like John Cleese. I mean, he makes me laugh when I see him in um, Faulty Towers. But everything else he does, it just leaves me cold. You know, he doesn't make me laugh at all. You know, he's not, but he's not a comedian, is he? He's a, an actor. Yeah. Well, I don't, I'm not that fussed on, um, what's his name? Um, the coloured fella. Um, Lenny Henry. Yeah. Weird, 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 weirdly enough, I'm watching the uh, that new series about. Uh, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm a bit of a fan of Lord of the Rings. Yes. Uh, and there's, there, there's this series on now. I don't know if you've been watching it. Is that on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, he's actually in that, and he's a better yeah. actor than a com he's a better actor than a comedian. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're right. What I don't like is when they idolise the, the BBC and everyone else. They create these. They make these people to be. Um, they sort of idolise them and make them make them really important and like I really care what he thinks. They interview them and, and I don't really care what they think. If they're talking about their job, I'm interested, but their opinions and other things, you know, I don't care. I'm not interested. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. I, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, well, I come to you and I want to know about archaeology and slightly interested in what's going on and what your opinions are, but, you know, it's not, you know, not, that's the way I look at it. But then I'm a miserable old man, apparently. Are you? Well, apparently I am, yeah. I'm grumpy. Okay, fair enough. So what we're going to do with Doggerland today, for as, for as long as we're going to do it, um, you know, naturally, I've got a few things I've got on today. So I'm going to, we're going to see how this goes. And obviously, we've got an image of this <coughs> land there. And one of, one of the things I am going to be trying out, I've actually got Roger that I've got on Monday. And 
I don't know if you if you want to sign in on Monday as well in the evening, just on YouTube. You don't have to, you know. So doing that at seven o'clock. And what I'm going to be doing is is I'm going to start get to get into my um my live routine. Um, I'm going to be using um. in the subject you know two of us than me lecturing at you as we're doing today anyway i thought i'd mention that so there's there's four there's four things i want us to look at in regards to doggerland and if we start off with this statement this might paint another picture for most people in europe the north sea is a stretch of water crossed perhaps when going on a holiday or as part of a business trip. Well, I've read that before. Few travelers are aware, however, that these gray waters cover a prehistoric landscape that once stretched without break from England to the Danish coast. We've mentioned that before. However, what I will say today is that in regards to our doggerland, there's also a doggerland that affects the minds and aspirations of those in Europe. I have talked extensively over the past months, um, just a reminder that I might have a call coming in soon. Uh, we'll just take a quick break. Um, I may have mentioned over the past um, you know, few months, you know, how it affect our lives, you know, the mass wave, the the sense of over a generation, you would see major changes over um, these this time. I haven't made as much about Denmark and the Netherlands and the Low Countries, and they experience the same thing. They experience the sense of mass flooding. They experience the sense of mass change, uh, and they experience the same tragedy. So that's one thing that 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 I've not made much of, and maybe we could sort of look a little bit more into that today. So. When, when, we, when I look at all these little snippets about Doggerland, each of them sort of try to take us in, a, um, in an almost similar direction. But one thing I will say about Doggerland is it's massively important to the study of prehistory. And it's massively important to the study of the Mesolithic period. We are now scrambling ourselves in archaeology, looking at the Mesolithic period, looking at new sites such as Boulder Cliff, new discoveries of Star Kra, formerly the footprints of the um, of our um, western coast at Merseyside. And we're looking at Hermitage in Ireland. Uh, we're looking at Colonse, the Hebridean Islands. We're looking at little snippets from Shetland. We, we're finding a lot of stuff and we're finding a lot of evidence up in the upland areas like the Kent. Gorms. And that site last week that we looked at, at Warren, which is southwest of Aberdeen. But the Doggerland itself is massively important to the study, not of our Mesolithic, but European Mesolithic period and also Mesolithic period across the world. So we, we've got to think ourselves very lucky to have this wonderful archaeological resource along our coastline, both west and the east coast. Some things are starting to get very, very clear, dates. But there's one date that might surprise us today. Some experts are arguing that the Doggerland landscape was lost earlier. Right, okay, there's nothing wrong with that. So if we, if we change the map a little bit, and we go to, there's loads of little maps here. It's absolutely intriguing, right? And we sort of scroll down here and we keep looking, lots and lots of maps, right? And we start to think that all of these maps are very, very different as we scroll down. But there's one map that I'd like to chuck in there. Now, just to just to give us food for thought, sometimes it's good to be unbiased. Sometimes it's good to be bring everything in. And this is what I like doing with the Mesolithic period. I can bring everything in and say I'm wrong or right. 
and you could say that you're wrong or right and what have you. Some experts have been saying that the previous maps that we've seen up until 8,200 years ago, 8,500 years ago, 8,000 years ago, roughly around the same time span within the space of 500 years there, that was when this great tsunami, which we've re renamed the Great Wave, occurred um, from the Turinga sh Shelf up near Norway. And the land bridge between Great Britain and Europe was lost forever. Some experts argue that by eight, by 8,500 years ago, that's what it looked like. In fact, the great wave hadn't occurred yet. It was then the great wave that removed all those coastal margins forever, including Dogger Island and, or Dogger Bight. So just putting that in there, but if we go to our narrative that we've been doing for the past few weeks, that it was 8,200 years ago that the land bridge was lost. The same thing occurs, a massive calamity that affects human lives within our coastline and across our coastline as well. When, 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 Goff, we can just, can, I, I'm okay. gonna take that go call ahead. a minute, right? Go ahead. So if you bear with me, yeah, yeah. And, and we'll go from there.
They're just getting generally worse, aren't they? You know, you've got the, got the NHS is in crisis, you've got um, law and order, none of uh, police officers really. Everything is a bit of a, a real shambles. I'm back off. Okay. Do apologise. Right, so okay. where are we? Uh, are we still on the image? No. We are now. Yeah. Right. Okay. Anyway, we need we need to get to another image, and just sort of these these constant maps of Doggerland. There's just so many out there. But one thing that we can agree, and that this this is this is the extreme. You know, you you can you can think this is the, the extreme of maybe twelve thousand years ago, but most people have discounted that. Um, and you know. I think that's a rather interesting one. But anyway, so so just just keep that keep that in mind a minute. So obviously there is lots of things that that we've looked at with Doggerland. But I can remember that there was one thing that we just dismissed. Right? And this came to fruition on Tuesday and what I dismissed was the following statement and we, we've not looked at this at all if we, if we read this whole thing further warming and rising seas gradually flooded low-lying lands some 8,200 years ago a catastrophic release of water from a North American glacial lake and we know about that tsunami, that tidal wave, from a submarine landslide off Norway inundated whatever remains of Doggerland. Right, okay, just the thing that I'm really interested in with that statement. So if we if we go back to our opening one, which is I don't know if actually what we'll do, we'll use this one, yeah. The what thing that I'm interested in is that North American glacial lake. Now it doesn't sound as important as I'm making out. However, 
as a hypocrite, it is more important than I make it out because one thing that we've discussed a lot is Doggerland. Yeah, we, 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 we've discussed about the effects of this tidal wave um, on Doggerland. We've, uh, we've, we've, we've just mentioned a little bit of the land bridge between Ireland and mainland Britain, wherever it is on that chart, depending. Some say it goes north of the Isle of Man. Some say it's linked with the, with the Isles or whatever, right? It's that point of the, this North American glacial lake. There must have been so much water in this North American glacial lake um, that it must have been the equivalent of billions and billions and trillions of tons of water, more than, more than the ice um, that is melting every year in regards to the ice caps um, in Antarctica and uh, the Arctic. Whatever this glacial lake was, it must have been absolutely immense to have actually affected the sea level in our North Sea. And to actually get to the North Sea, it would have actually have gone um, via the Western Coastal Board. Uh, and that's a good point. So the catastrophic effect of water would have affected not just the East Coast, but the West Coast. Um, and this is one thing that, that we've understated, the, the, uh, the amount of change that would have occurred on the West Coast. We've got it from Ireland, where, where we sort of look in the middle there. <coughs> Um, um, sort of <clears throat> on the left of the lettering where the island is there. And we've got what's known as the River Shannon. So we do believe, and, and, and this is the point, when we did that site in Ireland, and we looked at that site at Hermitage, River Shannon on the western coast of Ireland, it did say that the site had evidence that there'd been a mass flood. I can remember doing that. There, there was a mass flood at the, at the site of Hermitage and the site was abandoned. Now, if that is associated with a massive water release in North America, we can see that that had a catastrophic effect on the West Coast as the Tariga shelf had on our east coast. Things aren't always what they seem on the surface. Looking at the area between mainland Europe and the eastern coast of Great Britain, you probably wouldn't guess it had been anything other than a great expanse of ocean water. But roughly 12,000 years ago, as we know, as the last major ice age was reach reaching its end, the area was very different. Instead of North Sea, as we've already said, it was sloping hills, marshland, heavily wooded valleys and swampy lagoons. And we've got to see that on the on the West Coast as well. We see exactly the same evidence on the West Coast, actually. When we go down to um, more or less the tip on the West Coast of Wales, a place called Marlos Bay, that shows a, a huge expanse of timbers um, at low tide, which I've seen, and off the Cardigan coast, which I've seen. We've said this, but when we give that description about looking out at the distance, sloping hills, valleys, heavy wooded marshland, that would have been the same on the west coast as well. Swampy lagoons, the west coast as well. We still, when I, when I, uh, I haven't mentioned this for years, I'm going to mention it now. When I used to live in Cumbria, I used to live in a place called Arnside, which is a little bit north, uh, a little bit northwest of Lancashire and Carnforth in, in Cumbria. It, it's, uh, it's Arnside. And, there, and there, at a place called Grange over Sands, there's a great salt marsh. And when I used to go back and forth to Barrow in Furness, because, you know, we would leave Arnside, we'd go over the train bridge and we'd go all the way to Barrow in Furness. There was this marshy lagoon and I just used to think, is that what Doggerland used to look like? If I take those words away and I just think this is what the western coast of Great Britain looks like today. It therefore must have looked like this to a massive extent, to a massive expanse back thousands of years ago. So. 
we don't need to look far to try and understand this great inundation and this great sense of change. Mesolithic people populated Doggerland, and these were the these. And this is the other point that I made on Tuesday. I said already that people from Doggerland, those that managed to escape the Great Flood over time and manage, maybe those that outran this huge tidal wave, right? Or those that were prepared for it, had, you know, had, had moved. They, 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 they were here. But then I, I said that, but one of the points that one of the points that I have been intimating for the past few weeks is that the evidence in Ireland, the evidence much earlier when well, in the earlier lectures when we looked at the, at the Scottish Islands and so on, much of the evidence tells us that the people from Doggerland being displaced from Doggerland into, into what we now know as the United Kingdom, into what we now know as Northern Europe, Denmark and the Netherlands. They were extra people. They were people that moved into areas that people already lived. Did it cause any conflict? We've got no evidence of conflict. What I'm trying to say is this is this is quite a damning indictment of archaeology. What I'm trying to say is that there were already large numbers of people living across the United Kingdom. At the end of the last ice age, 12,000 years ago, and what I've also intimated is that there may have been large numbers of people living in amongst the ice in microclimates where areas were warmer in amongst the ice age and the ice sheets that existed beyond 12,000 years ago. It's the only explanation of, of the true diversity of people that lived across Great Britain, and we detect that 10,000 years ago. What I'm trying to say, to develop, we'll use the word society in brackets and apostrophes or whatever, to develop the society that we're actually seeing at Boulder Cliff, to develop the society that we're seeing in Ireland and the Cairngorms and Orkney and all the rest of it through, through Mesolithic activity. These people must have existed there for a long time to have developed that society. And that would have meant that they were able to cope with the cold conditions in regards to um, the, the ice age and the ice sheet, which is something that I think lots of archaeologists are afraid to mention, but it's what the archaeologist tells me and lots of other archaeologists as well. So this, this thing, this, this point that, again, we're repeating, but, um, you know, people could see that the water level was rising. Therefore, they were already in, in the upland areas. And therefore, when they were already in the upland areas, when they saw this great tidal wave 8,200 years ago, they were already there. But large numbers of people would have undoubtedly ignored this and been killed. A bit like, a bit like the stories of, a bit like the stories of Noah's Ark. And again, I, I, I've displaced the story about Noah's Ark in, in regards to, I've said that I believe that the legends associated with Noah's Ark were in fact people moving to upland areas whilst they saw the people in low, lowland areas waving up at them saying, why, why are you up there? And then suddenly the great flood comes in. They all die, all the animals die, but the people in the upland areas are safe. Why? This is, this is the point. Um, this is the point that I've mentioned, Goff, they, they, they talk about building, a, they talk about Noah building his ark uh, on the top of Mount Ararat. What a, what a freaking stupid place to build a boat. Except if you built a corral, which was the shape of a boat, which acted as a vehicle to save some of the people and to save the animals, that could be seen as a boat within the landscape that was now flooded. And, and the strange, strange thing is, the strange thing is, I, I know I'm using lots of metaphors, but when I woke up, wake, when, the, when I wake up in the morning, like because I'm, I'm basically on top of a hill, when I look out, when I look up out of the valley to the left of me, and when I look at the valley to the north, it, 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 it it's, it's surrounded in mist. It, it's, it's like, it's like I'm surrounded in water. Now, if you take that metaphor and think about how people lived and how people thought and how people came up with legends like Gilgamesh and, and, and Noah's Ark and, and the Great Flood and this Great Flood. It all makes sense. These things did happen and they did happen. Uh, I don't know if we, we, we come to it or, or, or we mention it. And this isn't, this isn't a massively long lecture, but one thing that I would say is that 
this event that happened, these events that happened, more than one event, these could happen again. And if there was a tidal wave that was 10 meters high tomorrow, uh, rushing down, maybe up the eastern or, or, or western coastal board, right? Large populations of the British population will be wiped out. Every single major town along the east coast would be would be over Newcastle, the likes of um, Edinburgh, the likes of London, the 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 likes of Norwich, all, all all these places. Yeah, Norwich. I know that's further inland, but that would be flooded out because the tidal wave would reach inland because it's fairly flat. Hull, that would be gone, um, and even places like Cardiff, that would be gone. Swansea would be gone, right? Oh, Carnarvon. Um, I'm sure the water would make its way into Carnarvon Castle. So, D, it, it's. I think the impression that I've given Goff is is that these are events that have happened in the past, and we're safe from them. They cannot happen again. That's totally untrue. They can happen again. They will happen again, and they have happened in the 1950s. The Eastern Seaboard. Hundreds of people died because of mass flooding, which we were unprepared for. London is up for a kicking if any of these events happen. And the reason, one of the things that I, that I will say is that we're not prepared. We, we, we have ignored, we have ignored this history. We have ignored the evidence. And, and we as archaeologists are saying, look, this is going to happen again. No, it's not. But... The government of Rio de Janeiro, uh, let's start again, the, the government of Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, they decided, right, we're not going to have those two two as major cities. We're going to build Brasilia. Um, we're going to build Brasilia. I think it's hundred. Is it fair a few hundred miles? I, I think it is anyway. I'm not sure. But but uh, whatever the distance is, they, they built their new city inland in the heart of the Amazon rainforest. And the reason why they did that was because they knew that Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro gets flooded. So one, one, of the, one of the world's greatest cities, Brasilia, is actually built because they know that um, their city will be safe. And I think that's quite an interesting way of looking at how important, how relevant, and how people look at um, uh, all, all this whole thing. We, you know, we, we, ignore, we ignore the past at our peril. So again, we, we, we ignore what archaeologists say at their peril because it's, it's archaeologists in Denmark and the Netherlands and Belgium and in France. They've been collecting all these artifacts. They, they've, they, they've got bucket loads of... of they, you know, right, this is one thing. Um, in the Netherlands, they, they've got... They, they've, they, they've got teachers that take their children out on beaches to collect material that's been washed up from out there. We're not talking about fossils. We're not talking about um, the Second World War ammunition. We're not so talking about any of that type of stuff, right? What, what we're doing is that they're collecting material that is thousands of years old. In other words, they're actively recording Gogolab. Uh, this, this is great. They're actively recording out what's out there and, and, and they're getting the children involved and they're getting the children to see how important Doggerland is and, and how relevant Doggerland is and what the story tells them and what the story tells their population, how 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 they can really understand and, and sort of integrate the evidence. So, again, it's not just us studying this. We We, we can see really that the sophistication of oil companies drilling out in this area, uh, out on the North Sea seaboard, is actually giving us some more data. And, you know, we, we go on to a piece about wind farms, but there, there is a time in history in the 1970s and 80s that, we, that data was not being recorded. I was told by my university lecturer um, that up, in, up on the island of uh, Shetlands, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, there were no archaeologists. All sorts of things were being found, but they were just being discarded. Now, we don't really know, because we've lost the opportunity, how, ex how expansive the Doggerland shelf was, because all that evidence has been lost. 
very recently because we chose to ignore the evidence. But those in the low count countries are really starting to record these low lying settlements. They're, they're starting to understand that, you know, in the story of the Mesolithic people and their homeland of Dogland are cautionary tales for the consequence of a ras rapidly rising sea level. Glacial melt forces the Mesolithic people out of their homes. And now Dogland, like the fabled Atlantis, is just a sunken and mostly forgotten culture. But it's a culture that we cannot forget because the perils of forgetting will affect our future generations for a very, very long time. Now what we then go on to is the, is the, is the, is the item. If we can look at this one. Um, there we go. We've, we, this is very familiar. And what we've got, we've got an, another article. Now, this article itself is, is equally fascinating. And I, I just want to, I, I want us to look at this and I want us to absorb this. So here we go. And this is an article that was actually printed this year. Not, not five years ago, not two years ago. It was actually printed this year. So it says fears dash for wind power could cut off lost world of Doggerland. It's quite a statement. Archaeologists worried rapid expansion of North Sea projects could remove access to rare Mesolithic remains. Well, we've already mentioned this and, we, and I've also said that this is an opportunity. Some archaeologists are using it as an opportunity, but there's a bit of a problem. <laughs> the maritime resource is not protected the same as the land resource. So in other words, if, if say, for example, you wanted to build a big supermarket outside Lancet Major Gough, you would have to employ archaeologists to look at the land and while well, you know you, you've you've um, you've told me about things and I investigated them uh, the Aston Martin plant you know new things were found but but we've got to that's land archaeology and even there the the, the government of our day has, has basically said to get things built quicker we, we we don't need archaeologists investigating as much as they should but archaeologists are still an integral part of the planning process for now but out at sea is different um, unless an area is protected by um by maritime law it, it, you don't really need archaeologists investigating so what what they what they've what they've basically said the archaeologists have said right give us give us some money right and we'll do your seismic surveys and we'll also um do some augering for you this will in turn tell you where it's best to put your wind farms We've got the data, you've got the data, everybody's happy. So this is what they're sort of doing, right? It's not always working, but this is what they're sort of doing. And with that, um, we're able to understand some of the landscape. And the particular landscape is where it says Doggo Hills and where it's sort of south of there, and sort of over towards um, um, the, the east of there as well. So it's, it's not bad news. But we don't have a lot of time. Therefore, it's it is bad news because we've got to work fast. Because when as soon as the wind farms are built, it, it sealed off access to what's there. Because you can't sort of have archaeologists with underwater machinery excavating in areas where there's power cables. So we've got to do it now. Or we might not get an opportunity for, you know, generations. Much remains to be learned about the humans who roamed the planet before the advent of farming. There's a common perception that they were short, brutish and nasty and that they had to keep moving and scrambling around to feed themselves. I've not made that statement before, but it's what some people still believe. However, Vince Gaffney, the landscape archaeologist at the University of Bradford, who we mentioned last week as well, who is actually still um, a consultant for the new series of Time Team on YouTube. He believes, like me, that this is a completely different picture. And it's that sort of 
Britain was just a range of hills on the edge of Europe back then, and the hills that are now under the North Sea are an extension of that. Plentiful fish, birds, animal, and fresh water to be found along the rivers and coastline. Now, one thing that we, one thing that's remarked on Tuesday was about fish, right? Uh, and the remark that was made on Tuesday about fish was when, when Dogland was flooded, is it a reason why we don't find much fish in the Neolithic diet, for example? Well, we, that, that's a bone of contention, but even though there's a little bit of a doubt, we could, we could discuss this. We could say maybe they didn't like to go near the coast because they, knew, they had known what had happened in earlier generations. And after all, we don't know about other floods that occurred. You know, the, the, the flooding of the land is a constant thing. Uh, the flooding of the land is a constant threat. However, we can turn it the other way around because I have, I from sort of day one of doing the dog land and the Mesolithic period, I have basically said, look, if you, if you think about the, this great flood coming and it's occurring slowly but surely and then suddenly you get the great flood and the land bridge is lost that's the picture that we've given what about what about this which also makes sense that there were there were seasonal floods and people were aware of these seasonal floods and when the so the seasonal floods would come in and then the water would go out and people were aware of this. Well, surely they could um, optimize the potential of that level of flooding, a bit like the River Nile. I know the River Nile is fresh water, and I know that this is going to be seawater. However, the River Rhine is fresh water. So if that flooded the landscape, like the other water systems in the area, people would have been aware that sometimes floods are not as devastating as I've made out them to be. So that's a, that's a really, really good point. This vast lowland area, as we said, would be covered in woodlands and forests. And the area that we're talking about is a whopping 180,000 square miles. And I've just got a little bit of a message coming here in a minute. Um, can you can you uh, can you can you just bear with me a minute? I've got I've got a problem to deal with. I've got a problem. Hang on a minute. Hang on. Bear with me. I've got I've got a problem to deal with. One sec.
Uh, sorry, sorry, Goff. There's there's a, a, a problem with somebody being picked up. I'm, I'm going to be. I'll be there now. Okay. Give me, a th give me a couple of seconds. Okay.
Right, I'm back again. Okay. Good. Back again. Right, okay. You're going to have to remind me where I was. You were at uh, the wind farms, the uh, discussion about building um, these wind farms and the, the technology uh, in, the North, in the North Sea. That's right. So there, there was a there, there was a thing I was just about to mention. So I'm just going to get back to that point. Okay, so we're going to go there. Right, okay. Bear with me a sec. I'm just, as this is being recorded, I can go back. I can get to my last point a second. Hang on. Okay. Right. Anyway, crack on. So this the this whole world and we we have said that we've not just got our recent history, which is going back eight thousand years, ten thousand, twelve thousand years. We're talking about a landscape that that we're now detecting that people have walked across for 800,000 years. So that would explain the footprints, at, say, for example, at Haysborough um, on the eastern coast. Um, that would explain the Neanderthal evidence. And going, looking at the, the idea of the Neanderthal evidence, looking at the Netherlands coast, they, they've actually started to find, thanks to people going out looking at beaches because what what they've got they've got the dredging so so they're dredging up um the the earth and the sandbank and the peat they're dredging all this up and it's being dumped on the beach, uh, beaches as, def as sea defenses um and then people all that's being eroded away and then that's that's moving in and we're getting a mixture of evidence from it's, it's like a book from um tens and hundreds of thousands of years of evidence we've got hyena bones we've got mammoth bones we've got homo sapi neanderthal bones we've got uh modern hominid bones we've got all sorts of stuff all mixed together and all the tools so it's great so this is what we're actually getting so so what we've got just directly off the eastern coast there, um, Vince Gaffney leading a project. Um, they, they've actually uh, um, joined in with these seismic surveys that I mentioned earlier on in, co in connection with the oil and gas and the wind farms. They've actually mapped a whopping total of 85,000 square kilometres of coastline, which is absolutely amazing. And what they found up off the Norfolk coast there uh, they they've they found a river system, a complete river system, 25, 25 miles off the coast of Cromer in Norfolk, a complete um, river system, which they've actually mapped. Um, and they're actually coming across 
this this is the other thing as well is that they're, they're coming across material that had been deposited at times when it was believed that people couldn't have lived within this landscape when the landscape was meant to have been frozen so we're starting to challenge those questions of when people lived within this world one of the questions vince gaffney this landscape archaeologist has been looking at um, itching to answer um, how how much people settled how much people settled within the Doggerland landscape and how that links within the landscape on either side of the channel. And what they're saying and what I've been saying, and this is basically, you know, un underlining everything that I have been saying. This is what Vince Gaffney says. He says, we suspect that life might have been much more civilized than we imagine. And that these people had learned to preserve and store food. So that's the point. This is the this is the thing you see. We're, we're not talking about read that again. When we suspect that life might have been much more civilized than we imagine. Wow. And that these people had learned to preserve and store food. So we're thinking, right, okay, let's just think, right? They lived, they had settlements. We're getting that evidence over 10,000 years ago. They're they're a bit like the Amazon Amazonian people. They 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 understand the landscape. They can read the landscape. Everything's going on. Um, everything's fine, right? But the idea that they're actually storing food, um, and they're understanding the need to store food, and they're able to store food. And you start to think, hang on a bit, hazelnuts. We're finding hazelnuts at various different sites, from from um, Aysbury up to Hoyk up to um, the, the Western Coastal Board. We're finding evidence of hazelnuts in Boulder Cliff. We're, we're finding uh, mass amounts of shell fish dumps. And we're thinking, oh, I don't know. Well, what does this all tell us? So, so they're harvesting and they're storing. They would also like to understand how much social interaction occurred between different communities and whether they traded goods. Well, what did we have last week? Nab head. We've got evidence at Nabhead that they actually traded goods. Or, and, and there was manufacturing sites, not just trading, manufacturing sites, where at Nabhead in West Wales that we saw last week, we, we, we've got an area where there's tens of thousands of bits of waste shirt and flint. Amazing that. And what's happening with the product that they're producing? Where is that? They must have been trading it because it's certainly not at the site. And we've got those wonderful pendants with drill holes in them. The bro lots of the broken ones are at site, but they must. We've got evidence of these pendants elsewhere, like at Star Car with the wonderful Star Car pendant. So they would, they they would have been more similar to us than we could ever imagine. And this was a time of massive change for human society, coping with, with the challenge of climate change and sea level rise, and moving from a hunter-gatherer based economy to the foundations of agriculture. For Vince Gaffney and colleagues, the rapid development of offshore wind power presents an incredible opportunity and a concern. We're now in the perfect position to explore these areas and extract sediment cores, but we need the funding to do it as fast as the opportunity to pursue such research will effectively disappear over very large areas of the seabed, effectively forever. But I see this as an opportunity. And what they're saying is that they're gonna be updating this sort of story and article and how this interacts on the 20th of November this year. So we, we'll, we, I don't know if we might visit back there because we'll be definitely in the Neolithic by then. Um, but we'll see. So the other, the other, the other little thing that I, I wanted to mention be before we finish today is is this. And what we'll do, we'll we'll, we'll change we'll change the plan. We'll we'll change the map. And go back to this one that we started off with. And this puts a different perspective. This sort of rounds off sort of the Doggerland thing on, from a different angle. So we'll, do, we'll just recap. Specific evidence that a sunken forest exists further south of the Doggerland emerged in 2014. Um, so yes, that that makes sense. We, we we've been getting that, but we've we've got actually got we've actually got more evidence than just supposition and surveys. 
and bits of tree tree trunk off the Norfolk coast. I think we're talking about 25 miles out off the um, um, off the Norfolk coast, right up to 25 mi miles out, right. Um, they're they they're finding evidence of human uh, human um, artifacts and so on, but specifically 300 meters off the north um, Norfolk coastline, which is starting to get deeper water. They're finding very very large tree trunks, very very large tree trunks, not the little ones sticking out along our shore, right? 300 meters out off the North Norfolk coast, they're starting to come across very very large tree trunks, and they believe from the dating evidence that we're actually getting from coring, is is that these tree trunks are very old. They're 10,000 years old, so yes, really big old tree trunks, 300 meters out over 10,000 years old. That's a lot older than we believed. Now, that's a really interesting point. These were revealed after, sea bear, after the seabed was disturbed during the winter storm surges, 2014. Provisional uh, estimates that we got are at least 10,000 years old and oak. And the reason why that's significant is that I talk about tree lines. I basically said, you know, uh, you know the tree line, probably reached the whole of Britain by about 10,000 years ago. But these are very, very mature trees. They had been standing for hundreds of years. That means that the tree line had got to where that, just south of where that's got the word Doggerland there. So sort of just that, that sort of area there, just south of all that. Uh, what they're actually finding as well, something else is in evidence within these tree trunks. When they've examined the tree trunks, they found large holes in the tree trunks further up. And these large holes look like they've been worked by animals such as owls, nesting per, uh, perches, which have been made into the trees by medium sized birds. Further evidence of this tells us from elsewhere that these medium sized birds may have actually have been tawny owls because they actually looked up off the coast of Boldercliff, the Isle of Wight. They found evidence of tawny owls, which which is which is quite which is quite surprising. Um, and the evidence of the tawny owls is is basically this evidence of these holes associated with the timber. Um, and if that's the case, that the the tree line must have been so developed that um, the animals, the flora and fauna must have been associated with them as well. So finding evidence of these tawny owls um, and indications of tawny owls tells us that the that the woodland was very, very well established 10,000 years ago. And that does actually change the picture again, meaning that maybe the ice may have melted sooner. Maybe the trees were able to tolerate um, these conditions a lot earlier than we ever suspected. If that's the case, there's, there's gonna be those human populations much earlier living within this landscape earlier than 12,000 years ago if not very, very, very well established 12,000 years ago, because they'd been here all along, living in amongst the ice, alongside everything else that's going on and all the things that go bump in the night. On that note, Goff, we're going to call it a day. Uh, are, are there any questions? No, no it's very interesting. And uh, it's, um, uh, you've conjured up a picture of our landscape there and uh, probably people living there with their, in, in the woods, uh, and it's it's very interesting. And funnily enough, uh, particular moments are relevant. But uh, I met a bloke at the garage last night, uh, yesterday, at Alan's garage, and he's on business down here, getting a new tire, and he he's got a caravan at uh, Cromer. Yeah. Uh, holiday caravan. It's he's got to move it. What all the way from Norfolk? No, no, he's just got to move it a couple of hundred meters inland. Oh, right. Because right, of okay. the erosion, yeah, which is terrible. There, you know, it's uh, sort of.
ties in a little bit with what we're saying about the changing landscapes, you know. Oh, yeah, ex exactly. And, and uh, yeah, no, I thought I thought he's been turfed off, turfed off then. But um, no, that that's that that that's that's absolutely fascinating because um, again, it makes archaeology relevant because yeah. by moving your caravan, it's an activity that is affecting your life because of change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you mentioned that. Um... The Dutch and probably the Danish as well are quite interested in uh, the Dogger Bank and what was there before. So that that's good, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that 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 is very relevant. That is that is. Yeah, that's great. That's very good. Thanks for thanks for taking the time this morning. So what's no, that next week? What's that? What's happening next week? Thursday is normal. Thursday night, seven. Thursday. Thursday, completely normal. Seven o'clock, no change. Everything's fine. That's oh, so lovely. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much. And I hope, hopefully, we'll have to see some familiar faces like Henry back again. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be great. Good. All right, then. He'll, he'll tell us all about his adventures. Okay, Goff, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for taking part, and I will see you next Thursday, seven o'clock. Okie dokie. Bye-bye. Take care, lovely. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you very much, everybody, for joining my lecture today. And thank you very much. Take care. Bye. We're going to end this live lecture.